is uh, en route, a uh, little bit uh, delayed by a last interview he's doing uh, on his way here, sort of multitasking. Uh, so we will get started, um, but probably just um, 10 to 15 minutes a little after we had hoped. So please, if you need a uh, break or want to get a drink at the back, uh, feel free to do that. But otherwise, stay, um, stay close and we will be starting as close to on time as we can. Is there a Wi-Fi? Totally got to get myself a video for uh, Osgood. That's pretty amazing. Uh, I'm uh, Lauren Sawson, the uh, dean uh, here at Osgood Hall Law School, and it's a huge uh, pleasure to welcome you all uh, to welcome uh, His Worship uh, Mayor Mackie Manchin to uh, what we hope will be his home away from home, and even uh, more special to have some members of his family join us today as well. And uh, of course, it's a, uh, as I said, a family affair for us uh, in more ways than uh, than one. This is part of a student-led distinguished speaker series that was developed uh, by students and really for students. The goal was to think of the people that uh, our uh, law students most wanted to hear from, most felt they could be inspired by, and most uh, you know, feel that they could be challenged by, and then to invite those people uh, to spend some time with them. And uh, it was a, a, you know, remarkable how many say yes, and remarkable on the kind of day you've been having uh, hearing the interviews and seeing the different speeches that you left time on a Friday afternoon for this. So we're incredibly um, uh, grateful uh, to you and again uh, to address the all-important question on many of your minds. The hashtag for this event uh, <laughs> is Menchi at Oz, O-Z, and uh, Calgary Prospers is a second hashtag that uh, one should use to follow this entire tour and you've seen a bit of Calgary prospering in the video. You're gonna hear more from Calgary's uh, 36th mayor, who's now in his second uh, term. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, for many of us, the moment where um, even though we heard a lot of buzz and uh, the election itself was uh, a major milestone uh, for Canada and for North America, it was really around the, uh, the tragedy, the floods of this past summer that many of us uh, came to see the importance of uh, leadership and the importance of community and uh, the importance of galvanizing uh, the, the best aspects uh, that, uh, that we bring uh, out of care for each other and uh, seeing silver linings on dark clouds, but also uh, the very real changes to infrastructure, transportation, growth, development uh, that are the essence of city building. Uh, and I think Calgary has been uh, a beacon uh, for many across the country, and uh, it's not only because of the mayor, and uh, it's also something that wouldn't be possible uh, without uh, the mayor. Uh, and I, uh, at a last, uh, as a last personal uh, note, I think anyone who's been uh, to Calgary takes a little bit uh, of it uh, with them, particularly in the last couple of years, where there are so many uh, centenaries, 100th anniversary, the Stampede, many other institutions, uh, and, uh, and of course, um, the uh, Council of Canadian Law Deans uh, had a Calgary stampede of our own and we all got white hats from the mayor and uh, it was a rock star kind of moment for, uh, for all of us. And he brings that energy, uh, brings that optimism, uh, brings those ideas to every uh, event he's part of there and, uh, and has taken it on the road uh, to, um, to, again, our benefit. So those who are interested um, uh, in the Osgood Distinguished Speaker Series at Osgood DSS is the student-led uh, uh, Twitter handle and you'll hear more about uh, the talks that have come, those that will come, 
uh, but I think it's fair to say the one that is here uh, is a highlight uh, for us all. So please join me in welcoming uh, His Worship, Mayor Nancy to us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, he, he looked good in that hat. He really did, and I'm a bit uh, disappointed that he's not wearing it as we speak. Um, but thank you all uh, for being here late on a Friday afternoon. It's really terrific to see so many of you here today. Uh, and wasn't that a great video? I love that video. Uh, I love it because it tells you a lot about our city. I also love it because everyone in it is beautiful and young, white. Uh, <laughs> It was sort of like my trip to Queens yesterday. So, I am uh, here in Central Canada um, talking to people from across the community. How many are Osgood students? Okay, how many are lawyers or students of law? Okay. All right, I have an admission then. And my admission is this everyone always asks me, why did you run for mayor? And the real reason I ran for mayor, you see, is that I have a friend who is now my chief of staff and a great political star in his own rights. And he was a securities law partner at the firm that's now called Denton's. And for 16 years, I am older than I look, for 16 years, I tried to convince him to do something else with his life. And I could not do it. So the real reason I ran for mayor was in fact that I could at least do one good thing in my life, which is to remove one lawyer from the practice of the law. <laughs> in fact, I succeeded in removing two from the practice of the law. It's sort of like that story about all the starfish washed up on the beach. You can't save them all, but you can save one or two. Uh, and that was my goal. More seriously. I was in Toronto on a speaking tour last, exactly eight months ago. And I had to cut the trip short immediately after speaking at the University of Toronto. So I blame the University of Toronto. Because this is what was going on at home. And I want to start there. I want to tell you a little bit about what our community, and when I say our community, I don't mean Calgary, I mean Canada. What our community has been through over these last short eight months. That's the Bow River. The Bow River is one of two rivers that run through the city of Calgary, the Bow and the Elbow. I know that's funny. That's the Bow River, which normally on a summer day will run at 1 or 150 cubic meters per second, 100, 150 cubic meters per second. That day, that Friday when I was supposed to be in Toronto, that's the Bow River. Uh, that, I took that picture, by the way, from a helicopter. That's the Bow River running at about 1,500 cubic meters per second. The Elbow River generally runs through downtown Calgary at a pretty placid rate, 30 to 40 cubic meters per second. That Friday when I was in Toronto, Upstream of Calgary peaked at 1,200 cubic meters per second, from 30 or 40 to 1,200. The neighborhood you see at the top of your screen on the south bank of the Bow River is the neighborhood of Bowness. The reason I like this particular photo, the reason I like this particular photo is because I want you to look at the bottom of the screen and look at that neighborhood on the north bank of the Bow River, Montgomery. Those roads are dry. The basements don't have any water in them. I'm setting my timer so I don't go on too long if you're wondering what I'm doing. And that is Mother Nature. Even in an incredibly sophisticated country like this, where we think we have beaten the forces of nature, nature can be that capricious. <coughs> At the top of your screen, those inlets you see of the water used to be roads. Those plots of trees between the inlets are people's houses. And that is, in fact, what we were facing in our community. <clears throat> this was a site that was altogether too common during the flood. A bunch of trash, a bunch of rubbish outside of somebody's house. I want you to look closely at that rubbish. Those are people's photo albums. It's their kids' artwork. It's that couch they saw in a catalog and scrimped and saved because that was the couch they always wanted. It's people's lives just out there on the lawn, waiting for some amazing public servants, the public servants who collect the garbage, my colleagues, 
to come and try and bring a sense of cleanliness and normalcy to their community. And certainly, one of the amazing things that we've seen over the last 18 months, or the last eight months, I should say, one of the most amazing things we've seen that we've reflected on is how incredible it is for us to live in a place where government works. In a place where dedicated public servants go to work every single day to make sure that we are safe and to make sure that our lives are just a little bit better. And certainly in the last eight months we've seen incredible things from federal public servants including members of the armed forces. We've seen an amazing response from our provincial government in Alberta. But in particular, I have 20,000 colleagues in the city of Calgary. They drive buses, they build roads, they program complex IT architecture. They respond first when there are emergencies. God bless the garbage men who work every single day to bring a little bit of cleanliness into our community. And certainly we are blessed to have public servants like my colleagues at the City of Calgary work for us in every community across this country. But today I want to focus on something a little bit different. The waters peaked on Thursday night and Friday morning. By Sunday, the waters were already starting to recede, leaving behind this extraordinary devastation. And over the course of that weekend, I started to hear from citizens over and over again, how can I help? What can I do? And so I asked some colleagues of mine at the City of Calgary to actually spend a bit of time managing the volunteer response. And much as I love my colleagues and I love civil servants, sometimes they can run in circles a little bit. And they got pretty freaked out. We don't really know how to handle volunteers. What about the legal liability? What if somebody gets tetanus? How do we get them there? What do we do? And they were running themselves around in circles to the point where I actually had to assign one of my own staff members. I have a very small staff. Uh, and brought her in and said, your job is to babysit these people <laughs> until they actually get an answer. Late on that Sunday night, I left the emergency operations center in the hopes of getting an hour or two of sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, 7 a.m., my alarm went off. And I turned on the radio and I heard an announcement that the city of Calgary would like anyone who cares to volunteer to meet at the stadium a couple hours later at 9 a.m. And I was surprised by this. I didn't know that was going to happen. So I phoned back and I said, what did you guys decide after I left last night? And they said, well, we decided we needed to start. Um, and I said, well, you've gone about it kind of a funny way, giving people only two hours of notice. No one's going to show up. And they said, yeah, well, that was actually on purpose, Your Worship. Because we actually don't know what to do when they get there. <laughs> so we're hoping that today we'll have 100 or 200 people show up um, we will be able to deploy them, and that will give us the lessons we need for tomorrow where we can handle a bigger group of people. And I said, you're crazy. Who's going to show up on a Monday morning with two hours' notice? You'll be lucky to get 30 or 40 people out there. And I said, well, I better go out there myself, and I hauled myself uh, over and drove to the stadium, and I got to the stadium just before 9 o'clock, and this is what I saw. Thousands and thousands of people, young and old, from every walk of life assembled. By the way, all these are pictures I took, which is why the photography is so poor, <laughs> uh, with my iPhone. We didn't have a PA system. There was no way to communicate with these folks. And then I remembered something. The fire chief had loaned me a vehicle so that I could get around to the evacuated areas uh, during the flooding. By the way, he still hasn't asked for it back. Don't tell me. <laughs> and it had a light. It had lights and a siren. And I thought to myself, they don't let me touch the lights or siren. If you're wondering. <laughs> and I thought, I really want to. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, if it has lights and a siren, it must have that voice of God you never want to hear if you're driving. Pull over now. Sure enough, it did. So I climbed up on the hood 
of that vehicle and I reached into the driver's side window and took out the little microphone and I started to talk to the people. And meanwhile, one of my colleagues from the city of Calgary was standing below me and said, Mayor, we've run out of forms. <laughs> we can't get these people to sign the liability waivers. You'll have to send them home. I really wasn't willing to do that. And so, from the hood of that car, I said, you know what? We've run out of forms. We have no room on the buses. But you're all here. You're all ready to work. You're all ready to go and help in whatever way you can. So you know what? You know the parts of the city that have been flooded. You know the neighborhoods that have been, been impacted. Just go. Just go. You'll find out how you can help. You'll find out what to do. And that started the most miraculous thing. Tens of thousands of people self-organized to go and help people they didn't know. These are all volunteers doing hard, dirty, horrible work. I show this picture for a couple of reasons. Number one is, these people had no idea whose house that was. They just knew that the people in the house needed help. They are disgustingly filthy. It wasn't exactly pleasant mountain spring water that they were cleaning out of people's basements. I learned another thing about floods that day. Floods impact dormant mosquito eggs. Mosquito eggs that have lied dormant for years or decades. As soon as they get wet, they hatch. So imagine this. These folks are filthy. You don't want to smell them. They're covered in mosquito bites. And they have no idea whose house they're working in. The other reason I wanted to show you this picture is I wanted to point out that they're eating hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> because that is another story about community that everywhere in our community people figured out how they could help we had explosions of lemonade stands in every neighborhood little kids selling lemonade for flood relief people brought food some people like the folks in the picture learned way more than they ever thought they would know about taking up drywall and everyone figured out what they, with their own two hands, their own minds and their own hearts and their own spirit could actually do. I love to tell the story of Sam's mom. Sam's mom has a name. She has a profession. She's a lawyer. But right after her house was devastated, she just thought of herself as Sam's mom. And I remember she told me, you know, Mayor, everything in my house is gone. I don't have a stove, I don't have a fridge, I don't have cabinets, I don't have any way to prepare meals for my family. But you know what, Mayor? Tonight for dinner we had hot shepherd's pie. And what this is really about is not the shepherd's pie, it's not the hamburgers, it's not even the fact that this tremendous force of tens of thousands of volunteers, there was a point where there were 15,000 volunteers from Calgary working in High River, a town of 12,000 people. So certainly the work got done much quicker than it would have gotten done otherwise, but that's not what this is about. What this is about is all of these people understanding at what they thought was the lowest point in their lives, where they felt like they had lost everything understanding that they lived in a community where people cared about them understanding that they lived in a community where people are going to look after them that first picture that i showed you is of a community called boness and in boness the very first street the street you couldn't see at all it's called bow crescents and i had the chance a little while later to go and visit bow crescents and i met a couple who were back in their house but there was nothing in the house. It had been stripped down to the studs. They were sleeping in hammocks. It was like camping indoors. And that couple, they found a piece of plywood in their basement. 
and they had scrawled a message on that plywood and they nailed it to the tree in the front yard. And for me, that, more than anything else, is the enduring image of what is the costliest natural disaster in Canadian history. And that is really what I think we could, ah, that keeps doing that, <laughs> what I think we could talk about today. We lost some stuff, we gained a community. And that's really where I want to focus today. I want to talk about community. And I want to talk about citizens, and I want to talk about citizenship. Some years ago, when I was a volunteer, I had the opportunity to work on something called Imagine Calgary, which was a project to create a 100-year vision for our city. 18,000 Calgarians got engaged in talking about what they wanted their community to be. And we developed a vision for our city, a vision of a city that is a great place to make a living and a great place to make a life, a city where we are connected, a city where we share success, a city where everyone has the opportunity to live that great Canadian life. And I've tried to translate that in the work that I do every day. We had an election in 2010, as the Dean talked about, highest voter turnout in since 1977, if memory serves correctly. I once asked the city clerk, why 1977? And she said, that's the first year we actually started to count voter turnout. <laughs> so I say it's the highest in, in history. And since then, there's all these notes here, but I find them boring, and I'm not going to go into them all. Okay, maybe I will. <laughs> About the things that we've done to try and increase citizen engagement since then. A budget process where we simply go up to people and say, what would you like us to do more of? What would you like us to do less of? How should we pay for it? 23,000 Calgarians engaged in helping us create our budget. It was remarkably drama-free. And on Monday, I launch it again for our next four-year business plan. We go to people where they live. We don't expect them to come to city council meetings and sit all day and wait to get their five minutes at the microphone. We go to shopping malls and festivals where people are living and breathing the same air as their neighbors. We make sure that they can, in fact, get more involved wherever they can. One of my favorite, favorite things is we developed a new 30-year plan for our transit system. And one of the best ways that we actually got the input of people who use transit is this. You'd be standing at your bus stop in the morning in a very fancy bus that was covered in post-it notes with other people's ideas, would ride up to your bus stop, and if you got on that bus that morning, you got a free ride. But in return for the free ride, you had to spend your entire commute talking to the senior managers of Calgary Transit <laughs> who were inside the bus about your experience with transit and how it could be better. And the reason for that is that I fundamentally believe in a philosophy that everybody is an expert in their own life. So take transit as an example. I happen to be a transit nut. I love buses and trains, and when I travel, I always take transit from the airport and try and figure out how it works. And when I was at Pearson Airport yesterday, the most exciting thing I saw was the, what's it called? The blue something? The Maryland Monroe. No, 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 the train, the train. Oh, the Union Pearson Express. What a boring name. Come up with a better name for that. Um, anyway, um, and to see how that is happening here, stuff like that is amazing. And within Calgary Transit, I've got lots of colleagues. I've got colleagues who understand fare optimization. I've got colleagues who understand network design. I've got people who know how to drive a bus and who know how to drive a train. But none of us are experts in transit. You know who the expert in transit is. The expert in transit is the person who takes the bus every day. She can tell us when the system is working and when it isn't and what simple things we do need to do to make it better. And that's really a cornerstone of the work that we do. The second cornerstone that I just want to talk about briefly is how we engage more people in the community. I used to be a professor. And when I was a professor, in fact, I always have to correct myself. I didn't used to be a professor. I am a professor. I'm just on leave. The university is expecting me back on January 1st, 2018. <laughs> and my field is nonprofit management. If I were still doing that work, the next 10 years of my life would be here, where I'd be asking myself the question, how do we do that? 
how do we get people that engaged in their communities? And I think I have half the answer, but I don't have the other half. And half of the answer is setting the table, setting the expectation for people to serve, to be able to do things in their community. And government has a role to play in that. And nonprofits have a role to play in that. The part that I don't have the answer to is how do we take that and that, people doing this at a time of crisis, and apply this kind of humanity, this kind of resilience, this kind of power of everyday people. How do we take and apply that to poverty, to homelessness, to environmental degradation, to all of the myriad issues that we as a community face together every single day? I don't know the answer to that, but I certainly know that it's within our power to try and solve that problem. Shortly after I was elected in 2010, I pulled together a group of people that I called, well, I didn't call them anything actually, that's part of the story. I pulled together a group of people, super volunteers, and I said, you got 30 days to help me with a problem. And that problem is how do we get more people involved in their community? How do we take that level of excitement that we felt during that 2010 election and keep it up between elections? 45 days later, they came back and they said, Mayor, good news, we've come up with a name for our committee. <laughs> Super volunteers. They could not have done worse. The Mayor's Committee on Civic Engagement. <laughs> They've changed it. I just got a memo. They sent me a memo. The Mayor's Civic Engagement Committee. <laughs> Okay. Sometime after that, they came to me with a simple idea, and I'm wearing a funny little flower today that my cousin gave me. Usually, I have a lapel pin uh, with a big number three on it. The number three stands for the idea that these folks brought to me. It's a very simple movement. It's totally open source. I want you to steal it for your own communities. It's called Three Things for Calgary. And all it is is this. I encourage every Citadel citizen, every single year, to do three things for their community. Could be big things, could be small things, doesn't matter. Shovel your neighbor's walk, run for student government, start a new initiative about something you're passionate about. When this idea was first put to me, I actually said to the Mayor's Committee on Civic Engagement that this was probably one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. I said to them, guys, you've done something amazing. You violated the rules of logic because you've simultaneously created something that's too simple and too complex. It's too simple because we're not telling people what to do. I'm an academic. I know that the number one reason people don't volunteer, nobody asked me to. So you have to actually tell people, here are ways in which you can help your community. And it's too complicated because you're asking people to do three things. You gotta lower the barrier to entry. Just ask people to do one thing. And then, of course, I discovered that those two elements were precisely why this program is so successful, precisely why tens of thousands of Calgarians have signed on to it. It's because precisely by not telling people what to do, but by setting an expectation that you've got to do something, we give people the power in their own minds to make their own choices, to figure out what they're passionate about, what they can use their own hands and minds and hearts to do. And of course, it's not really about three things. It's about creating a lifetime habit of service by having people continue to think about ways in which they themselves can make a change in their community. Every time I talk about three things for Calgary, I talk about the top secret fourth thing. And I'm going to share that with all of you today. The top secret, it's not that top secret because I keep talking about it, but the top secret fourth thing is just this. As you do your service, don't be shy. Talk about it. Talk about the difference you're making in, in your community, and more important, talk about the joy your service brings you. Inspire others. Mentor others to do their own acts of community building, large and small. Set that expectation. And that is how we build a great community. So one other issue I want to touch on today, and then we'll have a chance for some dialogue. Uh, I'm more excited about the dialogue than anything else 
Mary, first time ever I'm actually going to finish sort of on time. Not even close. <laughs> the power of our community. The power of Canada, the power of Alberta, the power of Calgary is not what you think it is. Indeed, in Calgary, people in Ontario are always surprised to hear the following fact. I'm going to blow your mind. The Canadian oil sands, the engine of our prosperity, the reason that we as a nation have survived the global recession better than anyone, those oil sands are nowhere near Calvin. <laughs> They're not underneath those cycles. <laughs> in fact, they are almost a three-hour flight from Calgary. If you're in Europe, they'd be halfway across the continents. So you have to ask yourself a question. Why is it that those office towers in that picture, those terrific head office jobs, second only to Toronto and head office jobs in Canada, those 5,300 tech startups, in Calgary, the highest rate of tech startups per capita in the country, not Waterloo. <laughs> <laughs> Why are those jobs in Calgary? They could be in Houston. They could be in Shanghai. They could be in Dubai. They might even be in Toronto. What is it about those jobs? that make them want to be in Calgary? And the answer is very straightforward. It's an unbelievable place to live. And that's what our strength is. That we've created cities in Canada where people want to live, where people want to invest, where people want to raise their families. That we've created communities in Canada that are sticky, that people feel like they want to be a part of. This is stuff that really matters. Calgary has been ranked in the top five cities in the world in which to live by the Economist Intelligence Unit for three years running. Strangely enough, ever since I became mayor. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that there are three Canadian cities ranked in the top five is something that's extraordinary. The cities, of course, are Calgary, Vancouver, and... Um, <laughs> Lots of tall buildings, somewhere near a lake. <laughs> Suburb of Mississauga, I think. Anyway. <laughs> but that's something that is actually pretty extraordinary. The fact that we have managed to craft that in this nation, in a nation which, by the way, lacks a national urban strategy and always has, and if you want to ask me about that in the question period, I'm very happy to answer. But the fact that we have created that kind of community here in this nation is something that's extraordinary. And I'm going to let you in on what I think is the secret of our success in this nation. It has very little to do with carbon molecules in the ground. And the reason I want to raise this with you today is because I also think that this, the secret of our success, is under significant threat. And I think that every single one of us needs to recommit ourselves to making sure that we battle that threat. And the secret of our success is just this, it's very simple. It's that we figured something out that evades so many in this broken world. And what we figured out is just this, that we're all in it together. That our neighbor's pain is our pain, that our neighbor's success is our success, that every single one of us deserves the chance right here, right now, to live a great Canadian life. That it doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter what you look like, it doesn't matter how you worship, it doesn't matter whom you love. Every single one of us deserves the opportunity to live right here, right now, a great Canadian life. I told a story earlier today, and I think I'd like to repeat it with you only because the Dean made me think about it. He talked about all the centennials in Calgary, and there's, if you're a historian, there's funny reasons that I spent all of 2012 marking centennials of various institutions in the city of Calgary, the centennial of the library and the Calgary Park System, the centennial of Calgary Stampede. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. 
Besides saying it was the first playground in Calgary. The reason for that, of course, is that 1912 was the height of the first great boom in Calgary. Interestingly, 1913 was the bottom of the first great big bust in Calgary. <laughs> and I have spent very little time doing centennial celebrations in the last year and a half. But I want to tell you about one of them. I had the chance to visit the centennial of a school in downtown Calgary. The school is called Connaught School. It's named after the Duke of Connaught, son of Queen Victoria, the Governor General of Canada. Came to Calgary to open the first Calgary Stampede. Connaught School is right in the heart of downtown Calgary. And as such, it is often the first point of call for people who are new to our country. And I had the opportunity to go to this 100th anniversary of this school. And I stood in that impossibly tiny school gym and looked out at these kids, 240 of them, from 61 different countries, spoke 42 different languages at home. And they were sitting there wearing their matching t-shirts celebrating the 100th birthday of their school. And in the back, their parents, wearing hijab and kanga cloth, talking about their new country and their struggles to fit in. These kids had only one thing in common, and that was they came to Canada with nothing. The lucky ones had their parents, the unlucky ones did not. And I talked to the kids that day, and I talked to their parents, and I heard horrible things. I heard stories of war, poverty, degradation, of violence so horrific you cannot imagine one human being doing that to another, let alone in front of a child. And that day, it would have been so easy to lose faith. It would have been so easy to despair for our planet and to despair for humanity. But I didn't. I stood up there and I had those one of those moments of incredible clarity. One of those moments where I knew one thing to be true above all things. And what I knew at that moment was that regardless of what had happened to these kids, regardless of what they and their families had been through, regardless of what vengeance some wrathful God had wreaked upon them, they had one stroke of extraordinary luck. And that stroke of extraordinary luck was that they ended up here. They ended up in Canada. They ended up in Calgary. They ended up at Connaught School. They ended up in a community that was going to look after them. A community that had a stake in their success. A community that would catch them if they stumbled and set them back up again. And I knew in that second, in that moment of clarity, that those kids were going to be all right. Every single one of them, right here, right now, we have a chance to lead a great Canadian life. That, friends, is the promise of our community. I am very, very lucky because I get to go to work every single day and work to fulfill the promise of our community. And if you don't remember a single other thing I said today, if you don't remember how outstanding Calgary is and how you should all move there immediately, I want you to do this. I want you to recommit yourself to fulfilling that promise of our community. I want you to think about how each and every one of you can use your own hands, your heart, your minds, your soul to make sure that we are fulfilling that, community, that promise for everyone and that every single kid in this community, regardless of what they look like, where they came from, or how they worship, or whom they love, that every single kid in this community has the opportunity right here, 
right now to live that great Canadian life. Thank you all.